except for the writer. Oh, right, exactly. Yeah. All right. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the York Civil War Roundtable. We've reached the appointed hour, so uh, rather than keep our speaker waiting, uh, I think we'll get started. And if you can bear with me uh, for a few minutes, I'd just like to go through some announcements of upcoming events that the History Center is hosting. Uh, I am Adam Bentz, and I'm the Assistant Director of the Library and Archives, and we're happy to work with Kathy and uh, with Scott Rosenau and Scott Mingus, uh, who are all the program directors of the roundtable. They've always been able to find some great speakers to come in and talk with us. Uh, so without further ado, uh, this coming Monday, something that might be interesting to Civil War fans, it might also be American Revolution fans. Um, so we will be featuring our bookmarked Zoom book talk. Uh, it's a new program that we started in 2022. The book, the subject this coming Monday, uh, that's the 23rd at 7 o'clock p.m., is Cabal, The Plot Against General Washington, which is a book written by historian Mark Edward Lender. And Lender will be speaking with us, and his book provides a comprehensive historical investigation into the Conway Cabal. If you're familiar with that, uh, you're probably from York. Um, he shines a light beyond the classic Cabal, what he calls the classic Cabal, which is, I think, uh, generally the story that most people are familiar with and explores the gradual attempt to take power from General Washington. Uh, I've read the book and he goes into detail about all the bureaucracy that was involved in the political, uh, very, very real political plots that were involved to depose Washington as head of the Continental Army. Uh, so uh, Dr. Lender will be here and will be speaking online uh, about how this crisis tested General Washington and would ultimately make him the man we remember today. A week from tonight, on Wednesday, May 25th at 7 o'clock p.m., we'll be welcoming the All Vets organization back into the meeting hall here, and they will be featuring veteran Phil Matt, who served in the United States Army in the 33rd Armored Division in, from 1963 to 1966 in Europe as a tanker, and he also served on the United States rifle team. Following week, on Thursday, June 2nd, the library will be featuring our, or welcoming our Writers' Roundtable. The Writers' Roundtable will be offering a small peek at York County's Cadoras Valley. That will be presented by Tom Yingling, who is president of the Cadoras Valley Area Historical Society, which is located in Jefferson. He is also the editor for the Society's bi-monthly newsletter. So please uh, join us on June 2nd for Writers' Roundtable. Following that on Sunday, June 7th at 2.30 p.m., we will be welcoming the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society. And uh, that meeting will start at 2.30 in the afternoon on, uh, on the 7th. I have a little misleading details in here. Uh, in any event, they will be presenting the Henry James Young Awards, which are awards that are presented to people that document York County history. Light refreshments will be served and more information and reservation links will be coming soon on our website. So always feel free to check events on our website for details about any of these or to register in advance. And uh, so I'd like to ask Scott Rosenau to come up and he will be introducing tonight's speaker as well as discussing next month's roundtable speaker. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for uh hosting us, being a gracious host to the round table of all these years. And glad to have another month of in-person meetings, looking forward to many more in-person meetings here over the coming months. Uh, as we look forward to next month, uh, we will be having another hybrid meeting as we are right now, and we'll be welcoming local historian, Jim McClure on Wednesday, June 15th here at 7 p.m. Jim will be discussing uh, his program after the Civil War, successes and struggles of York County's people. According to McClure, York County families suffered terribly in the Civil War. At the same time, county residents persevered and contributed mightily to the war and were ready for a new chapter in their story. The region's natural resources and proximity to markets put the county in a prime position for what was next, the Industrial Revolution. 
This program probes how York County moved on in the years after the Civil War with a focus on the accomplishments and struggles experienced by key figures from the Civil War era. Jim McClure is the retired editor of the York Daily Record and Sunday News, uh, USA Today's state editor for Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland, and previously, ser previously served as East Region Editor for Digital First Media. He holds a master's degree in American Studies from Penn State Harrisburg, where his research is focused on York County journalism history. He's the author or co-author of nine books on York County history and moderates the 15,000 member Retro York Facebook group. And there's always a lot of interesting things on that group. I, I subscribe myself and he always has some interesting stories on there. So you can check that out as well. Just go to Retro York on Facebook. Um, so um, also McClure is a past president of the Pennsylvania Associate Press Managing Editors. And uh, he has won uh, awards, the two G, G. Richard Dew Awards for Jour Journalistic Service, which is Pennsylvania's most prestigious honor for outstanding journalism. So we look forward to Jim's presentation next month. Uh, tonight, uh, we're gonna welcome Jerry Jones. He's gonna do a, a different kind of program than we've had before. It sounds really interesting. He's gonna be talking about the geology of the Gettysburg campaign. So uh, we definitely uh, wanna see what he has to offer. So we welcome Jerry up to the podium now and he'll give his presentation. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Good to be here. And uh, I was thinking about uh, coming in about uh, one of the one of the growing hobbies in, in the country, according to people that take polls, uh, people that raise chickens in their backyard, rigs and that sort of thing. And I got thinking, I said, I wonder if those people could be called chicken tenders. <laughs> okay, I'm just filling the crowd out to see what page I'm, I need to go to here. Okay. Anyway, uh, yeah, I am a. I've been a geologist for 43 years. Uh, uh, I have Jones Geological Services. Uh, we're housed out of the Spring Grove area, and I did spend 38 years working for York County Parks before I. Uh, said enough of, the, of this fun, let's go have some other fun. <laughs> and so uh, I'm gonna talk to you about Gettysburg Battlefield and, uh, and, and the rocks. So, uh, let's see. Do I need to turn this on the, is there an on or something? Yeah, if you push down to the dance, you know this doesn't make sense. Uh -oh. Might be froze up. I hear it dinging when I push it. There. Just put it the down. down. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, my name is J E R I. Uh, people ask me why is your name messed up like that? Because <laughs> my parents were told I was, they were going to have a daughter, <laughs> and they named me before I was born, and they had to take the doll babies back and get the. Bulldozers and dump trucks. So, you know about the Battle of Gettysburg. I proclaim I am not a historian by any means, uh, but uh, the biggest uh, uh, battle of the Civil War on United States soils, uh, seventy-five thousand Northern Virginia and and ninety thousand Army of the Potomac meeting for a reunion in Gettysburg. Uh, a couple of things before I get ready to get into the battle and the ca campaign uh, is the rock cycle and a thing called a geologic time. For example, the rock cycle, uh, everything in nature works in a cycle. So even for the formation of rocks, our earth was all magma at one time and that magma cooled, turned into igneous rocks, which are from magma, either deep in the earth or on the surface. They weather and erode, they turn into sediment that you find in the streams and actually part of the soil. All that gets glued together by mother nature and turns into sedimentary rocks, like sandstone, shale, limestone. And that rock can be heated and pressurized and turned into a metamorphic rock by heat and pressure. So a shale can turn into a slate, for example. Okay, and we do know today it is happening that 
that uh, metamorphic rocks are getting to be very, very, very deep in the earth by earth movement. And those rocks are remelting back into magma. And actually igneous rocks can go right to metamorphic. Uh, metamorphic rocks can actually go back on itself and become another metamorphic rock. So there's, there's some sub cycles in with all of that too. Uh, the, ge the geologic time schedule, you know, table, um, millions of years ago is what we, is how we think, okay? And uh, Earth is 4.67 billion years old. And uh, you'll see that where we're gonna talk about tonight, first of all, we're gonna talk about South Mountain and the Great Valley. And those rocks are, I don't know, 570 to 505 million years old, okay? They're not quite the oldest rocks in Pennsylvania, but they're, they're pretty close. And of course, when we get to Gettysburg, we're going to be up into what we call the Mesozoic era, the age of the dinosaurs. And uh, we can just easily say they're at least 200 million years old for most of it, OK? Oops. So like I said, we're going to start with uh, South Mountain in the Great Valley, what was happening out there before, just before Gettysburg. And then we'll talk about the Gettysburg area. So as you uh, probably know, being Civil War uh, interest people, the Union was coming up what we call the Piedmont of uh, actually Virginia, Maryland, and into Pennsylvania. And the Confederates were coming up in the Red Arrows up the Great Valley. That's where Interstate 81 is running. The Shenandoah Valley is south of here. The Cumberland Valley, we get into the uh, Lehigh Valley off to the right. And uh, the Confederates were using South Mountain as a shield, knowing that the Union was over there. They can't see us over here as they were heading north, supposedly, to Harrisburg and Carlisle. So, well, there's, uh, of course, South Mountain there and the Great Valley. So the Great Valley is limestone. That's a soft rock. So soft rocks do, uh, they make valleys because they're so soft. They weather and they root away. They don't uphold mountains or big ridges at all, okay? So that's why the Great Valley was there, enabling pretty easy travel for the uh, Confederates. And South Mountain is, is different. It has different rocks. It doesn't have any limestone. It's actually a lot of volcanic rocks and some metamorphic rocks, but making the mountain. So within South Mountain in Southern Adams County and Franklin County, there were copper mines at this time that the Confederates were in the area. Okay, it actually was the leading copper district in the whole country. Okay, and some of those mines are still there, uh, Roxanne standing in, there in the, in the right in a, by a mine shaft. And, uh, I have never read anybody doing any work. Did the Confederates touch our mineral resources? Other than one, one I'm gonna show you. I never have seen that. I don't know the answer. Okay, here's a piece of copper. In case you wanna see uh, copper from Adams County, that's what it looks like. Uh, copper is in the quartz, mineral called quartz. That's how a geologist buys his milk. <laughs> I like this side over here better. <laughs> and there were also iron mines, particularly on the west slope of South Mountain, facing Waynesboro, Chambersburg, and that sort of thing. Again, I have read nothing about the Confederates wanting to bother our mineral resources. But they were in operation. They were, they were producing iron. And uh, we had furnaces, which is coming up right there. The Caledonia furnace, we do know, was burned by the Confederates, although they were told not to touch it. They got an apology from the Confederates after the battle was over. Uh, we're sorry for burning Caledonia furnace. And historians are still fighting over if the furnace was really rebuilt and restarted after that. Of course, the uh, state parks have recreated it and reconstructed it and have a wonderful educational trail there now with it too. So anyway. Uh, so, so how did the Confederates get across South Mountain? We do know that they came through Monterey Pass. Anybody know where Monterey Pass is? Uh, off of Route 16, 
Blue Ridge Summit. Uh, they have a wonderful museum there in case you've never been there yet. They, that group has done tremendous stuff in the last four years. But Monterey Pass is, is one place we know the Confederates came up through, but where, where else did they come through? Well, on this map, this is South Mountain. And within South Mountain someplace, there is a geologic fault. Y'all know what a fault is? Crack in the earth where movement has taken place and faults usually crush rocks, which speed up the weathering and erosion of that rock. And now we have a gap. Okay, so let me help you out here, right there. Can you see the north side of South Mountain is shifted to the left more than the south side? By about three miles. So as that ridge was being pushed during tectonic events, something stopped South Mountain on the south side and the north side kept moving for another three miles, which took maybe 5 million years. <laughs> All right, well, where is that fault? I know we're playing games here. It's called the Carball Marsh Creek Fault, which happens to be a major fault. I'm not, I'm not gonna get into the detail, but it, it goes much longer than that red line. Well, that's where today, oops. <laughs> that's where, the, you weren't supposed to see that yet, okay? <laughs> today, that is where Route 30 runs through South Mountain, Caledonia State Park. If that fault would not have been there, did the, would the Confederates come through there? I doubt it. They would have to go up around South Mountain to around Williams Grove and come back down to Gettysburg or go through Monterey Pass, okay? So that geologic fault, the Carball Marsh Creek Fault, made their uh, mission through South Mountain much, much easier. So there's point number one. Yeah, I just throw in some you know, science is boring, we have to add some humor to it. <laughs> so trying to keep up with the world or get away from the world. <laughs> that never happened to me. That, that far where I had to climb a tree. I was pretty close there, but... All right, so we're going to go to Gaysburg. Gaysburg is located within the Piedmont Physiographic Province. We're located in the Piedmont right here. But we're in a we're in another section called the the, the uh, Piedmont Lowlands. We're in a valley, limestone. Okay, Gettysburg is in a, a different area called the uh, Gettysburg New York Lowlands section. Here's the Lowlands section of York. In fact, there is York right there, and the northern part of York County and much of Adams County is in this uh, Gettysburg New York Lowlands section. It's the youngest rocks in our area. At the end, I will show you exactly what was going on. 200 million years ago. So here we are on a geologic time schedule during the, the Mesozoic and the periods were the Triassic period and the Jurassic period is our rocks on the battlefield at their age. And so if you, if you of course go to Gettysburg, you climb in this case, the Culp's Hill Tower, you can see South Mountain out there. Volcanic rocks, hard rocks holding up the mountain. And here comes the Confederates through the, the uh, Cash Town uh, Gap and the, the Caledonia Gap uh, and uh, Gettysburg sitting down in a valley sort of thing. Now, what's on the battlefield and in, 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 in the area? Uh, ge geologists, we use a term called a formation. A formation is a body of rock that has some measurable thickness it was the rocks were all formed basically at one time period. And it could be only two, three rock types. Okay. And uh, they're mostly named from the place where uh, early geologists saw the best exposure of those rocks. For example, the Gettysburg Formation. Okay. It's actually named from the railroad cut, it's behind Lee's headquarters. That's the type site that the early geologists used. Let's call it the Gettysburg Formation because the outcrop right here is really good, okay? We have the New Oxford below that, the New Oxford Formation, which is not on the battlefield. And then above that, we have a Bendersville Formation named from Bendersville, Northern Adams County. Sandstone and shale, sandstone, shale, limestone. And then we have this rock called Diabase. You've been to Devil's Den, Little Round Top, that rounded rock like the one I have up here at the front. 
is diabase. You'll hear a lot about diabase tonight. That is younger in age. That's, that's the youngest of, rock, of this group. Okay, and there's actually two. I'm not going to get into the details of why there's two di different diabases on the battlefield, but there are. You just got to take my word for it. Okay? <laughs> uh, and you notice that the Gettysburg Formation, it is 16,000 feet thick. Okay, that's what, three miles. Over three miles, that sediment is three miles thick. Okay. What's it have to do with, with, with the uh, geology of the battlefield? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> there, so military geology, usually when they know there's going to be a conflict to make a battle, each side sent out their engineers or even people that studied the topography to figure out where's the best point to be. What should we be doing to protect ourselves? What can we do to protect ourselves? Gettysburg was a kind of a fast evolving thing coming together. It wasn't scheduled to be a, uh, any kind of conflict. So they didn't really have much time to do that. But it was, you know, it was decided uh, as it was all unfolding, both sides said the highest point. In this case, Little Round Top. If we can, if we can uh, uh, win Little Round Top, we might win the battle. That was the goal. So obviously, the first day of battle, South Mountain's out there in the distance. Here comes the Confederates walking the Thaddeus Stevens Railroad, right beside Route 30 now. And the Confederates, as you might know, and this is one of the stories I remember, is that the Confederates down in the railroad cut were coming up the railroad and the Union soldiers showed up both sides of the cut. That can't be a good feeling, <laughs> having, having rifles pointing down at you in a cut. Where are you going to go? But all this is sandstone of the Gettysburg Formation, OK? Here is the, uh, the one cut at the, uh, behind Lee's headquarters, sandstone and shale. It's, it's reddish brown in color. If you, get, if, you, uh, if you drive up around Dover and uh, you know, even the Dillsburg area, uh, that, uh, that whole northern part of your county, you'll see the red color. And the sandstone is actually called the brownstone buildings. So they made the older houses out of, out of brownstone. That's the sandstone that uh, most of uh, some of the, uh, the Gaysburg battlefield has on it. Igneous rock called diabase. Okay, it means it was made from magma. Now, in the case of, of uh, the diabase rock, after doing a lot of tests and research over the years, we now think the diabase actually solidified into a rock three to four miles beneath the surface. It was not magma. I mean, it was not lava, I'm sorry. It was magma inside the earth that cooled and solidified. Why is it at the surface today? Because everything else around it is, was softer, it weathered and eroded away. But it's so hard. It's nicknamed Ironstone. If anybody is a farmer in Northern York County or Adams County, and you hit diabase with your plow, <laughs> you know it. It rattles. You hit it with a sledgehammer. Sledgehammer comes back and hits you in the face. What are you trying to do to me? Very, very hard. And as I mentioned, the high ground was the chosen spot. By both sides, if we can win that point right there, we might have, we might have a victory. Why is the high point there? It's called the rock diabase. And if you're thinking ahead of me, you're probably going to be right about the fish hook. The fish hook is on diabase ridges. The hard rock holding up the higher elevations. The little round top cemetery ridge uh, and hill, right around the Culp's Hill. That's what the Union developed, obviously, as you know, that we can uh, hold off the Confederates that were coming, basically trying to come all around us in the lower ground, more or less.
Diabase, it's one of, one of its uh, uh, properties, it, it weathers rounded. Spheroidal weathering, that will be on your final test tonight. Spheroidal weathering, okay. It actually uh, weathers rounded, as you know from being at Devil's Den. I'll show you a closer slide of how that's going on. Okay, it's, it's kind of a characteristic of Diabase. Devil's Den, by the way, is the type site for Diabase in the whole country. Diabase is not a real common rock nationwide. Only in the Gettysburg, Newark, Lowlands section across Southeast Pennsylvania, and it goes down into Virginia, North Carolina, Alabama. But uh, if you want to see dive base, you live in Colorado, you need to come to the East Coast. Okay. By the way, oops, there's the wrong one. Balanced rock. You know where I'm at? A geologist asked himself a question in the 1920s. I wonder if that rock ever moved. You know how he answered his own question? Underneath the, the balanced rock and the side rock, he put two hash marks on both rocks. And today they're still lined up. So it had not moved. Anybody ever see those hash marks? You're just like the educator at the Gettysburg Battlefield. She had no idea they were there either until I showed them to her. I'd love to take a high school class to Devil's Den and put the jigsaw back together. What pieces were where? Wouldn't that be fun? Because over the millions of years, probably 15 million years, uh, it's been under weathering. Okay, more severely sometimes than others. But the, the rocks got cracked by, by ice and thawing and broke apart. I'm gonna show you how that was going on by this. These are cooling cracks. Okay, think about a baseball field. And if it rains, there might be a puddle of water around second base. Well, if you let go, the water will evaporate, the dirt will dry, but it will not dry at a constant speed, so it cracks. Well, this is magma. The magma cooled at different rates, three to four miles beneath the surface. Okay. And you get weathering and erosion in there. Water gets in there and freezes. It starts to peel this, the rock apart. And particularly on edges is where we get to see the spheroidal weathering going on. Very slow process. And there's always a, a bench for a geologist to sit on, right? Never mind, I'll go on. Okay. Now, you know the battle of the, you know the story of the, the Confederate who supposedly was shot in Devil's Den from a sharpshooter and a little round top that uh, Mr. Franzonito, who was a historic uh, photographer in Gettysburg, still, still, still uh, does this, uh, proved that that soldier was actually killed 75 yards away and they drug him on a blanket to that position. And uh, they took the picture, but the blanket was still under the body. Oh, wait a minute, we got to take that picture again. Get, get the blanket out of there. Well, the reason I bring this up is because my dad was a wonderful Civil War uh, historian. And when I was knee high to a grasshopper, I was on the battlefield with my dad. Unfortunately, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> when are we going home? Can I buy a little cannon? You know, okay. But uh, that, that, that amazed me. Boy, that, that guy died right here. You know, and then, then Mr. Valentino kind of bust my bubble. Like, all right, well, okay, Diabase. Anybody, anybody live here in Northern York County? Shiloh Dover, ever, do you have Diabase on your property? Do you know? Okay. Well, if you do, you know that the soil isn't very thick. Diabase does not uh, produce a deep soil profile. If you dig down six inches, <clears throat> you're lucky. Well, Gettysburg, number one way to defend yourself was the trench in warfare, right? Well, Gettysburg could do that. Six inches down, okay. Six inches to me, um, two-thirds of my body would be sticking out. Okay, so they couldn't trench. 
So they had to, had to hide behind rocks or they had to build stone fences. Some of the fences were already there before the battle, produced by farmers, particularly uh, you know, out around the Pickers Torridge uh, area. A uh, little round top, uh, according to what Scott Megas has told me, those, are, those were built overnight by the Union because they knew the Confederates were coming. We need protection, okay? So they had to rely on the rock outcrops, Devil's Den, and other rocks and the stone fences to, to uh, hopefully survive. On one of my bus tours I did at Gaysburg, I just told, what I just told you, I told the group. And after I was done, a person in the group raised their hand and they asked me a question. Why couldn't they hide behind the monuments? <laughs> Seriously. I don't, I don't think a person's in here today. <laughs> I said the next bus through, through comes in about 20 minutes. <laughs> All right, so over at the Peace Light, a little higher ground, okay? So we have a dive base, we have a dive base ridge, the Oak Ridge uh, is up, it's coming up through here. And in fact, the Lee's headquarters uh, rock outcrop is right off here in this area of the, of the area. But then the Peace Light sitting on a dive base ridge also, which goes about actually 13 more miles in the northern Adams County. The, the dive base actually was quarried mostly around Ski Liberty, and it was marketed as the Gettysburg Granite. It's not a granite. It's close to a granite, just the minerals are a little mixed up. But in Gettysburg, there are, uh, uh, of course, granite steps. At the one funeral home uh, in downtown Gaysburg, he had a big wall of the, uh, the granite walls. My wife is a minister, we see at a funeral there one day, and that's what kept me occupied while he was. <laughs> and then we have Curiosity Rock on a little round top. Okay. Now, who was mighty enough to put those rocks up like that? Like building the pyramids, right? Well, we have a theory. This is what we think happened. Okay, where this is a big outcrop underneath the ground and the rocks got cracked by uh, tectonic events, movement of the earth that are shifting all around. And the rocks began to do seroidal weathering. Some of the dirt started the road away between the rocks. More dirt became eroded away as the rock got closer to the ground level. And eventually all the soil left and now we have the pile of rocks. That's a theory. Why? Because we weren't there 160 million or 50 million years ago to see it happen. Don't pass this around. But there is gold on the Gettysburg battlefield. Diabase sometimes yields gold. And we know for a fact that gold is in Plum Run, which runs through Devil's Den and uh, another place I will show you. So if I say anybody paying for gold, I know where you came from. <laughs> so we investigate, we dream, and we propose theories. So again, we weren't there, all right? So, uh, when Roxanne and I are uh, thinking the same theory, we're buddy buddy. <laughs> but when I come up with a different theory or she don't like it, she wants to drop a rock on my head. <laughs> so thinking, speaking of theories, this is my theory about something that devils in. And I'm, I'm trying to get somebody to prove my theory. That's what I need to do. First of all, you got to come up known up with a man-made stone flake. You know, flint, flint napping, okay. A flint napper, when he makes a tool or makes flakes, some characteristics of that flake show up to tell you how it was, was man-made. First of all, where he hit the rock with another rock, it's called the platform, it's a flat area. Underneath the platform, there's a bulb of percussion from the compression of hitting the rock, a bulb, the, uh, the energy goes to the one side of the rock and it actually bulges it out. Under that, we have ripple marks. And sometimes we have these 
has, has pure lines going vertical to the ripples. Okay, do you have that in your head? Because at Devil's Den, we think we have something that hit this rock. There's a platform. And here's the ball of percussion. And you can see the ripple marks across the rock. I'm not an artillery person, but I want to say that it was some huge cannonball that hit that rock and made that feature similar to somebody flint napping. I want Penn State to come down here with their with their detector and, and, and they can actually look inside the rock without dis disturbing the rock. They say that the minerals have been shocked. Very similar to when a when a, a meteorite hits the hits the earth. The rocks get shocked. Okay, we should see the same thing in that inside that rock. By the way, that's the original devil den if you don't know it. Right there. Where it was not Devil's Den right after the battle. Just this little cave that goes about 25 feet back into the rock. There was supposedly a, a, um, a serpent that lived in there uh, called Devil's Den. Now the whole thing's called Devil's Den. So over to the railroad cut I've been talking about. There's the bridge to the Peace Memorial. And here's the uh, signing order to the Gettysburg College of the uh, C CSX Railroad. And we see a nice sequence of rocks in here. Unfortunately, the stone gavians over here have uh, kind of destroyed our view uh, because Gettysburg College was afraid the bank was gonna fall out on to the tracks. So they put those gavian baskets up hiding some of the rock. But what's here, here's the sandstone and shale the red, the red rock, okay. And over here behind the wall is the rock called Diabase. I've been preaching to you. And Diabase was hot when it came up through the bedrock. So it actually baked the, this, the, uh, the brownstone, built, uh, brownstone, and it formed a rock in between called a Hornfels. That used to be a red sandstone and shale, but the heat, baked that rock, it metamorphosed it into a new distinct rock. I have a Hornfeld up here on the table, okay? All three of these rocks are on the battlefield, obviously, although you can't see them as well as you can in this railroad cut. Uh, in the wintertime, I know you can, you can go behind Lee's headquarters in the, in the area that they uh, tore down the motel and put that path and the walking path in, and you can kind of look down over the bank and see this uh, in, the, in the wintertime particularly. Here's some diabase uh, along the other siding. So why am I bringing this up now? Pick a torch. Okay. How many of you would participate in pick a torch? Is that right, Noah? On which side? <laughs> well, not, not the Confederate side, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but if I was a Confederate and somebody came to me saying, you see that cluster of trees over there? I want you to walk there. <laughs> Stay in our formation. And you know the story. Stay in the formation. And by the way, three or five, three or five of you are not coming back. I'll be looking for the next Greyhound bus. <laughs> okay. So, how does the geology play a role? Well, you notice how over there at the Lee Monument, Virginia Monument, it's on a higher ground. It's on a diabase ridge. Okay, that's called Seminary Ridge. So you, you walk downhill, you go across the lowest part of the valley, and you start walking uphill. And as you cross the Emmitsburg Pike, you come up another hill here and onto <coughs> Cemetery Ridge, which is, as you know right now, Diabix. So look at a geological thing here. They started on diabase, and they walked down, they went over a zone of Hornfells rock, which is not as, it's a little harder than the sedimentary rock, but not as hard as diabase. 
down in the valley, you had a little sandstone and shale down where the creek is. And then you walk back uphill and you go across another Hornfells and you hit the dive base where Almighty Hick broke out. 60 feet elevation from Virginia Monument to the, to the sandstone and shale. And 60 more feet back up the other side. That doesn't sound like a lot. But if you're carrying your artillery and your gear and on, you know, the weather was extremely hot, it was tough. Particularly then dodging all the bowling balls coming after you, okay? So I always, you know, I always tell the groups when we're at Pickers Charge imagining this that, uh, that you know, uh, Mr. Pickett apologized. I mean, uh, Lee apologized to, to General Pickett. But what happened? It didn't work out. Where actually Dr. Cuffey from Penn State uh, kind of has proven that uh, Lee learned that, that uh, procedure from the, what's it called, the Solophony Battle of Australia and France in 1858. It worked for them. He thought it might work in Pennsylvania. Springs were very important. Where to get my water? Diabase doesn't produce much water. Being so hard, the groundwater comes against the diabase rock, but doesn't necessarily come up. It kind of gets dammed up. Uh, the Hornfells lets a little bit of water through it. The sedimentary rocks are very porous. The water can flow right through that stuff. So the springs are going to be where basically the the diabase and the hornfells meet the sedimentary rocks. So the water is coming, being dammed up, and it will come up to the surface for less pressure. So Spangler Spring, for example, sitting on the edge of diabase, hornfells, and the sedimentary rock there at the base of Culp's Hill. And there are several other springs. You ever have your kids try to hold a moon? All right, well, I talked to a couple of you uh, here early about the bridge on Confederate Avenue. Okay, near the base of uh, Big, Ra of Big Round Top. Uh, Emmitsburg Pike, the Picnic Grove is right in here. First bridge, the only bridge on this part of the uh, avenues. It's kind of an interesting bridge. There it is there, it's called the Plum Run Bridge. The millions of people that go past here don't know what I'm gonna show you. It's probably a good thing. Because there was a quarry near York Springs on Lattimore Valley Road, actually on the south side of 15, south of York Springs, uh, where in the 19, early 1930s, they found 53 different dinosaur footprints. The quarry's still there today. It's not active. It's overgrown. Good time to go to the wintertime, so the snakes, alligators, crocodiles don't get you. And here's an early picture of the of a slab taken out of the Trossel Quarry in the local geology book. There's a footprint and a handprint of a, a Triopus dinosaur. These are the first dinosaurs on Earth, by the way. Way before the more famous ones that first and second graders know the names better than me. So on, it's, on the Plum Run Bridge, and this is on our website, uh, under uh, Adams County, Cumberland Township, is a, is a bridge. It's one way on the left hand side, three quarters of the way across, there is a slab that has a handprint and a footprint of the Atreus. Looks like that right there. Then on the right hand side of the bridge, there's one, two, three, four slabs of rocks on those numbered blocks of uh, Atreus, uh, Otazone, Grawl Leader. I have a grow later print up here uh, from uh, from Berks County, but uh, some of those prints are pretty obvious. Some of you have to be half drunk to recognize it. So here's a grow later print from the bridge. Here's the attributes one on the left hand side. There's the footprint, and right there is the handprint. So a trip is actually apparently used his feet and his hands to walk. Uh, on all fours, at least for some of the time. What do we think the grawl later looked like? Like that. 
He's about six, seven feet tall, eight feet long. Uh, he was a, uh, a theropod, means he's walking on his feet. Uh, we, we don't find many handprints of the, uh, of the, uh, the raw leader. Again, these are the first dinosaurs that were showing up in the Triassic period around Earth. Here's another a tree at this one. This is actually in the Adams County Historical Society. They may not have it on display. And finally, the monuments. <clears throat> we can do a whole program just on the rocks made from the, on, on the, the monument. The first shot monument out Route 30. They're actually renovating the farmhouse now. Uh, that's made of local limestone. The Roxborough conglomerate from Massachusetts, there in uh, Cemetery Ridge, is a, uh, a rock that has a lot of rounded pebbles in it, big rounded pebbles. It's a, it's a famous rock from the Massachusetts. And the Salem limestone, a lot of that's over in the, uh, or in the uh, toward the uh, Culpsville Spangler Spring uh, area uh, with the Indiana monuments. Uh, Salem limestone is a very famous building stone. Uh, some of the Lincoln Memorial actually is built of the Indiana limestone too. So it's just all kind of rock types. A lot of it's from uh, local, local uh, stone in that state. And of course, our own Pennsylvania monument, dedicated in 1910, Mount Airy Granite, North Carolina. The site of the largest granite quarry in the country. Still operating today. Anybody know, anybody know what Mount Airy is also famous for? You don't know me well enough to know, know my favorite TV show. You got it. Yep, Andy Griffith. Yep, Mount Airy is the model town of what Mayberry was modeled after. In fact, it's the hometown of Andy Griffith. And Thelma Lou still lives there. Every Wednesday, she comes out and she does a public appearance. You, get, you talk to her, you can get her, get her autograph, all sort of thing. But anyway, we go to Mount Airy, check out the granite quarry. It's pretty neat. There it is, the North Carolina granite quarry. Very famous uh, granite uh, building stone. <clears throat> Finally, where, what was happening around here when these rocks were all being formed? I call it geologic history, okay? So if we look at our world about a billion years ago, we're breaking up from a supercontinent. It was called Rodinia. We think it was very close to the South Pole. And you see this word right here called Laurentia? That's us. We weren't called North America yet. We were called Laurentia. So we were, things were breaking up. And we were actually slowly heading north. So about a billion years ago, so actually South Mountain, let me go back there. South Mountain was actually a rift of Rodinia. The volcanic rocks within South Mountain where the copper was found, that was formed by the rifting apart of Rodinia. And the, uh, the younger rock on top of all of that was actually sand from the beaches of a very, very early ocean. And then Pangaea, 300 million years ago or so at Gettysburg. Supercontinent. Hey, we just had a we just had another cycle there, didn't we? We had a supercontinent a billion years ago. It broke up. It came back together to form Pangaea. It broke up again. That's where we are today. And another 300 million years from now, we're all coming back together. <laughs> we think around the North Pole. And that's going to be called Amasia. Yes? On that uh, slide before that, you had a lot of blue. Was that actually water? Yeah, it was water. That came. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's just, that's just water, you know. So we think we are close to the South Pole. Uh, the dark line going across is not necessarily the equator. So yeah, we did, you see, you see where we are here now, 200 million, this is 
300 million years. So this is what, 200 million, 250 million years later, okay, that we're about on the North Pole, on the North Pole, the equator. So our climate here in Pennsylvania, when the Gettysburg rocks were being formed, were very similar to the Everglades. We actually find fern fossils in our area, York and Adams County, that look like relatives of ferns growing in the Everglades. And the piece of wood I have up here, it's actually a palm tree. Okay, so we were very hot when those rocks were being formed, tropical. And up and down the East Coast, uh, uh, if you remember that word, the Gettysburg Newark Lowland section of the Piedmont, it's not called the Gettysburg Newark section the whole way up and down the East Coast, but where the uh, orange and the reds are, these are all, uh, we call them rift basins of where Pangea was ripping apart. And right there, right there is Gettysburg right there in the Culpeper Basin south of us. Goes up into New England, uh, Connecticut, around New York City is where well, we think we had a hot spot where it was actually breaking apart. But if our, if our area, if the Gettysburg area would have rifted apart when Pangea was tearing apart 150 million years ago, 200 million years ago, today we'd be a part of Morocco with Africa. We may not have had the Civil War then, right? A stretch it. Okay. <laughs> so here's some links. Uh, we have some links on our website. Um, there actually are some good things out there uh, uh, done by the, the Pennsylvania Geologic Survey, uh, guidebooks. Uh, Dr. Cuffey, who, who just died in, in uh, January, who was really a person that taught me a lot about the program I did for you. Uh, uh, has written a couple of guidebooks with the Geological Society of America. Is out there online. So if you do a search for geology of the Gettysburg Battlefield, I'm sure it will come up. And actually, this is an increasing interest in, uh, in geologists. There's now a geologic guide of the Manassas Battlefield. And there, I, I did see some writings on Petersburg. So it's kind of an interest, it's, it's kind of a grow, very slowly growing uh, interest. But geology played a role. In any battle that you can uh, that you can look at, so I'm getting a little tired. I did have a real blast here tonight. Thank you very much. And uh, my friend uh, from Spring Grove took this picture, and I said, "Can I use that? Because it really represents what America is all about, and allows us to do fun things that we are doing tonight. Allows us to do our fun research that we do every day uh, out there." And I guess that's it. Okay. So, what's some questions now, Adam? Or that would be great. Okay. Is that what you want to do? Okay. Yes. I have a question. Um, I'm going to read from a write-up of yours from many years ago when you were spoken here before. And I think you might have talked about this. I mean, you did talk about biggest charge, but. The question was, why is there a valley in the middle of Biggest Charge? Because I've walked Biggest Charge, and they call it like swales. Yeah, that's a swell. The difference between, because you can almost like lose sight of people that you're walking with. It's like the ground is very uneven. Um, is that because it's on a diabase? That's because that's a sandstone and shale, the soft rock. Because it's very uneven ground. Yep, the swale. Yep, it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's wet around that area almost all year. Uh, so it, it will be uneven and a little sloppy, perhaps. But that's the sandstone and shale. The diabase is the higher ground, like at the Virginia Monument. And then when you get halfway down, you're on the Hornfells Rock. I have an order actually over here from the diabase to Hornfells to the sandstone. Uh, if you want to look at those when we're done. So, yep. Yep, another one. The farmers that were in Gettysburg. They were just were they just mammals. I mean, if there's only six inches of soil that you were describing, you know that you couldn't actually dig deep. Were they able to um, grow vegetables? I mean, that's you know, yeah, they weren't. Where that base is, it's not not cultivated fields. Um, so they 
Uh, actually, much of it was what was, you know, was and still is wooded. Um, you know, if you if you imagine um, Figgis Charge, for example, around the Virginia Monument and going out half mile, that's all woods now today, because you can't grow anything on that base really, because uh, it's really an orange clay. If you walk around walk around Devil's Den, uh, particularly on the top, uh, the clay is really orange. And that's a typical diabase clay. And I mean, it's clay. It gets hard. Uh, you try to plant anything in there, it's not gonna work. So, yep. Hey, back there. Can you find any of that um, stone that you've been discussing over here in the New York area? And the reason I ask is, if you get up to the top where UMPC, the church, the, the big building up there at the top, if you get up there and look out the windows, what you see is a big circle all the way around York City County, this yeah. little area down here. And I'm wondering whether there's any of that uh, base? stone yeah. that's you know, that has created this area. What you're, what you're seeing around there is the, you have the Helm Hills, Pigeon Hills, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ridge to our south with the, uh, where, where Penn State York is situated. That rock is hard rock. It's, it's not the diabase, but it's hard. I like uh, metamorphic rocks, quartzite uh, sort of thing. The only place around New York where you can see diabase, the actual diabase rock is out of, the railroad cut at Pleasant Acres. If you go across the bridge from Market Street to Pleasant Acres and stop on the bridge and look to your left, you'll be able to see a rock shedding out toward the railroad track. That's a dive base, we call it a dike. It's only a, about 20 feet wide. It was a crack in the earth that opened up and the magma came up through, solidified in that crack to close the crack up like a, a scar of a cut. And that, that dike actually runs from uh, Maryland. It goes through, uh, why do you think we have Ironstone Hill Road down near Lake Redmond? And it goes through Stony Brook and actually Rocky Ridge Park on trail, trail six toward the bottom of the park. You'll see rounded boulders and it goes across the Cadores Creek at Cadores Furnace. And actually goes, goes across the Susquehanna River at what's called the uh, Haldeman Riffles and stops near E-Town. E That's only about 20 feet wide. That's the only database that is well exposed in New York area. There, there's other dikes, but I, uh, I, I will not refer them to you go and see them because you'll, ne you'll never find the rock. But the reason we have all the hills around us is, is the harder rock. You know, again, Helm Hills, Pigeon Hills, um, the section south of the York Valley called the Southeast Uplands of the Piedmont, made of uh, metamorphic rocks. Some are harder than others. So if you drive down 83, there is no flat area on 83. It's, it's all like this because of the weather and the erosion. That's what's controlling our landscape right now. Good question. Scott, you have one. The work that they're doing on Devil's Den, is that because of those cracks you were talking about with the ice? No, they were, they're actually redoing the walkways that have been eroded and they were, they've been bad for a long time. Uh, they're going to do some uh, planting, try to make Devil's Den look like it did in, in, you know, in the wartime. But most of it's uh, for, uh, to get people around Devil's Den. Uh, easier not falling off the, off, off the sidewalk two feet into the orange clay. <laughs> Hopefully they'll be open in another, uh, what, three months. Well, another thing, I grew up in Indiana, so there's a very, you can see a definite difference when you get to a certain point because of the glaciers that came down. Is there any glacial impact on uh, what's the geology? Of the only glacial impact was the weather. Like 20 to 8,000 years ago, we were, we had to climb the Hudson Bay area does today. Pretty cold, we had warming spells and cold spells, and that made the weathering and erosion uh, on the battlefield, you know, more excessive. 
because it was colder. Um, and that may have broke some, broke some of the, the, the dye base pieces off the devil's den. You know, um, I don't want to slam the battlefield guides, but because they're very good at what they do. But once they dabble into my chapter of my life, they need to stop. Because they tell everybody, devil's den was formed by the glaciers. <laughs> I've, I've heard it numerous times. And I just kind of walk away. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, the, the Marine, uh, actually, I was down to uh, Tower City, uh, was the southern extreme up A1 of the, the glaciers getting to us. Uh, as you go north, northwest, Shemokin Dam above Sillings Grove is about the southern extent coming toward us. So if you draw a line from Shemokin Dam to Tower City, uh, and then up into uh, uh, the, the Susquehanna Water Gap. That's about the southern extent where the glaciers did come. Yep. During your lifetime, have you seen a, a bit of the climate change in your job in relation to I don't know, earthquakes in Dillsborough? <laughs> I haven't Dillsborough yet with an earthquake. Uh, um, or with fracking. <laughs> you had to bring that up, then. Sorry. Fracking. You want me to talk about fracking real quick? Yeah. Uh, I'm not an expert on fracking. Uh, I, I like to actually get a fracking expert onto my our Zoom rock room that we do twice a month, so I can understand it more. But uh, fracking is uh, it's like drilling for oil, except they're going down for gas. They're inserting uh, uh, bad chemicals, really bad chemicals, a lot of water. And the uh, idea of fracking is that that technology, they go down several thousand feet and they can, they can actually turn the, the drill bit to go this way. Okay. And that's where they, that's where the problem was that they're impeding on the, somebody else's property that they may not have permission to drill on. And now they're drilling on my property, but I don't know it because that's down there two or 3,000 feet. Anyway, when they pump out, with the gas, they get the gas out with what they're pumping out as far as the chemicals and uh, all the other um, uh, adhesive stuff to, to make the drill work. Uh, as I understand, they've been, they've been uh, getting ponded up to settle out. And then that water is pumped onto the tankers and taken someplace and dumped. Okay, and uh, Maryland has now stopped fracking. I think New York has just stopped allowing fracking because it's proven that it's bad for the for the environment. And uh, you know, but seven years ago when fracking was starting, I was at a geologic conference in in uh, Lancaster, and I was in a session with earthquakes, and there was a uh, he's, he's a former state geologist of Pennsylvania who was who was at that time at, at Penn State teaching. He did a program of Pennsylvania earthquakes. He left out fracking. And somebody asked him, well, what about the earthquakes that are being produced by fracking? He said, I was told I can't talk about it. <laughs> but we do know today that fracking does cause earthquakes. In fact, if you go into the Pennsylvania, uh, the Pennsylvania earthquake uh, system, which is a seismograph the whole way across the state finally, uh, look at their active interactive map. Every day there are what they call non-nature earthquakes, meaning that they're being done by in in industry, and they're all in the Appalachians, where fracking is taking place. But Oklahoma, Colorado, Ohio, proven that fracking does cause earthquakes. But that's way off the subject here, right? <laughs> I might get some nasty texts pretty soon from people, but all right. I think I actually told you everything. Uh, I wanted to tell you about Gettysburg. It's a obviously, as you know, it's a great place. Uh, but just wanted to shed a little angle on you tonight. Uh, don't forget about the geology and the the landscapes because they were important. There's two mystery rocks up here. Uh, one at this end and the other one right, right beside the dive base because it's related to it. 
The reason they are mystery rocks is because I forgot to print off labels for them. <laughs> I want us with you. Okay. So, any other questions? That's been real fun, folks. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.